going back as far as 1845, when Florida became a state and Mosquito County became Orange County and included Osceola, Seminole, and Volusia counties, gay life is undocumented in Central Florida until the 1960s. In the rural days of Central Florida, when the gay population of the area was small and before the existence of openly gay bars, gay men and sometimes lesbian women would clandestinely meet in designated places such as a park, a straight bar, or other business, the locations of which were shared by word of mouth. GLBT people hid their sexual orientation because of oppression. Homosexuality was condemned in law, by religion, and through our cultural expressions, including the media and general social discourse. A significant Florida law aimed at oppressing GLBT persons was the 1956 legislation that created the Johns Committee. One purpose of this committee was to eliminate homosexuals from state government and from public education. The Johns Committee spread terror among the closeted lesbian and gay population in state colleges. The committee often used uniformed policemen to pull students and professors out of their classes for interrogation because all homosexual acts were crimes under Florida law at that time. An admission of homosexuality constituted moral turpitude and was grounds for dismissal. Because of the Johns Committee, by 1963, 39 professors and deans were fired. 71 public school teachers lost their teaching certificates. Students were interrogated and subsequently expelled from public colleges. And the committee amassed 30,000 pages of secret documents and published the Purple Pamphlet a blatant attack on GLBT persons. To combat similar laws elsewhere and to ease the lives of GLBT people across the USA, brave gay activists came forth. Among these heroes were people like Henry Gerber, Harry Hay, Del Martin, Phyllis Lyon, Don Slater, and Randy Wicker. And who are these people? In 1924 in Chicago, Henry Gerber founded the first recognized gay rights organization in the United States. It was called the Society for Human Rights. Its newsletter, Friendship and Freedom, was the first American GLBT publication. The Society for Human Rights disintegrated after a few months following the arrest of several of its members. Harry Hay is considered to be the father of the modern GLBT rights movement. In 1948, while on the staff of a national presidential campaign, Hay wrote a background paper to propose a policy that would have declared homosexuals to be an oppressed minority. This was an idea that was contrary to the commonly held belief that GLBT people are sick sexual deviants. In 1950, to attack the oppression of gay people, Hay founded the Mattachine Society, which grew into a national GLBT movement. 
Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon established the first American lesbian rights group in 1955. It was called the Daughters of Belitis, or D.O.B. for short. Working closely with its male counterpart, the Madagene Society, D.O.B. fought for legal reform and gay civil rights. It advocated for more research into lesbian life, and the organization offered social support to lesbians and public forums to foster understanding about lesbian lives. In 1957, it began publishing the monthly magazine called The Ladder, which was the second lesbian magazine to be published in North America. The first lesbian magazine called Vice Versa was written and published by Lisa Benn beginning in June 1947 and ending after nine issues. Don Slater spearheaded the publication of America's first long-running gay publication called One. One began publication in 1953 and ended in 1967. In 1958, one won a landmark First Amendment case, which cleared the way for the distribution of GLBT publications through the U.S. mail. Randy Wicker, in 1964, organized the first gay rights demonstration in the United States. The protest was held in New York City at the military's induction center on Whitehall Street. The protesters picketed against anti-gay military policies. These are the activists who, with others, gave birth to the gay rights movement. Because of their dedication and hard work, more and more GLBT people began to challenge the status quo and to stand up and be counted. More also began to unite together into homophile organizations. Most, if not all of these organizations had social and educational goals. Some were also plainly political, favoring overt demonstrations to accomplish change. Initially, picketing was their tactic of choice, but later, sit-ins and breaking anti-gay laws were employed. Two law-breaking examples, both of which resulted in uprisings, occurred in California. The first was at the Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. Because Cross-dressing was illegal back then. Businesses that catered to gays were at times raided by police. One night in August of 1966, Compton's management called police when some transgender people became rowdy. When an officer tried to arrest one trans woman, she threw her coffee in his face and a riot ensued. Furniture and dishes were thrown, windows were smashed, and the fighting spilled into the street where a police car was vandalized and a newsstand was burned. The next evening, members of the GLBT community picketed the restaurant when the management banned the readmission of transgender people, resulting in more window breaking. The next year, another gay riot broke out, this time in Los Angeles at the Black Cat Cafe and Tavern. It was over an illegal midnight kiss on New Year's Eve between two gay men. The kiss was witnessed by plainclothes policemen who began making their arrests. However, a riot erupted and moved out into the streets where local residents joined the protest. A few days later, 
over 200 people picketed at this site against the raid and the unfair practices of the LAPD. The Stonewall Riots in New York City in 1969 are considered to be a pivotal point in the gay civil rights movement. The Stonewall Riots took place at a time of major unrest in this country. Confrontational protests were not uncommon in the African American Civil Rights Movement and in the Anti-Vietnam War Movement as well. The Stonewall Riots were triggered by a routine police raid on a gay bar in New York City. Because homosexuality was illegal in New York, Two men dancing together, or anyone cross-dressing, was cause for an arrest. Patrons increasingly protested the police arrests that were being made, and soon the first night of rioting began. To this day, Pride celebrations are held in June to commemorate the month in which the Stonewall riots occurred. Following the turbulent 1960s, the 1970s were less violent, but were still very repressive. However, signs of change became evident, such as the American Psychiatric Association declaring in 1973 that homosexuality is not a disease. Four years later in 1977, another major positive change occurred. An openly gay man was elected to public office. Harvey Milk, who is immortalized in the movie Milk, was the first openly gay elected official of a major American city. He served only 11 months in office when he was assassinated by Dan White, another city supervisor who wanted his job back after he had resigned. In 2009, Milk was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom the very first openly gay government officials in the United States were Jerry DeGreek and Nancy Wexler in Ann Arbor, Michigan. DeGreek and Wexler both were elected in 1972 and came out while serving on the city council. Wexler was replaced on the council by Kathy Kosachenko, who ran openly as a lesbian in 1974, thus becoming the first openly gay person to win office after first coming out. Meanwhile, back in Florida, when things were beginning to get better, they suddenly got worse. In 1977, a pop singer named Anita Bryant, who had several hit songs, began her Save Our Children campaign to repeal Miami-Dade County's Gay Rights Ordinance. Her success ultimately led to the passage of a Florida law banning gays and lesbians from adopting children. 33 years later, the law was overturned. Thus, it may be apparent that the 1960s and 1970s were a time of turmoil, a time of both national intolerance toward GLBT people, as well as a time of rebellion by GLBT persons against repression and discrimination. And this was also the time when Central Florida's 
GLBT community began to emerge and to develop. During the 1960s, the decade of protests and riots, three known GLBT businesses came into being in Central Florida. In the following decade, the 1970s, at least 18 GLBT businesses and organizations arrive on the Orlando area scene. Why was there such a growth in the gay community and its establishments in the 1970s and continuing on into the 80s and 90s? The opening of the Kennedy Space Center in Brevard County in 1968, in conjunction with other developments, brought more people to Central Florida to live. Among them, it can be assumed, were GLBT persons. Another factor contributing to the population growth was the opening of the Florida Technological University, now called the University of Central Florida, in 1968. The growth in Central Florida's gay population can also at least partially be attributed to the opening of Disney World in 1971 followed by SeaWorld in 1973, and then Universal Studios in 1990. Another possible contributing factor to the local growth of both gay and straight populations was the decline in the citrus industry in the early 1980s, following several major freezes. The shrinking of the local citrus industry freed lands adjacent to cities for further development and for a huge influx of people from elsewhere. Given the addition of NASA, UCF, Disney, SeaWorld, Universal Studios, and given an increasing national gay openness, that is, GLBT people becoming more willing to reveal their sexual orientation, the number of local self-identified GLBT residents has increased greatly over the past 50 years. What follows is an increased demand for and supply of businesses, services, and social groups that cater to that gay population. In 1969, the year of the Stonewall Riots, the first visibly gay business appears in Central Florida. It was a bar called the Palace Club. It was located at 4910 Edgewater Drive in Orlando. Bill Miller and his partner Michael Hodge leased half the building from the Liquor World family. They opened the original Palace Club here. Over the years, the bar's name and management changed several times. Eventually, two gay partners, Wally Wood and Jimmy Bruce, opened it as a lesbian bar called Odds and Ends. In 1983, the building became Faces. It was the first local lesbian-owned bar for lesbians. It was owned by Sue Hanna and her partner Angie Spruill and an unknown third person. Faces closed in 2007. The oldest GLBT business in Central Florida is the Parliament House. In 1975, Bill Miller and Michael Hodge opened it. Paul Wegman, also known as Miss P, the talented drag queen who helped to make the Parliament House famous with her 25 years of performances, 
once described the establishment as a Disney World for gays. After the deaths of Miller in 1987 and Hodge in 1992, both from AIDS, the family of Hodge ran the PH until 1999 when it was sold to a straight Canadian couple, Don Granitstein and Susan Unger, who as of 2010 still run the establishment as a gay lodge and entertainment center. In 1976, a year after the opening of the Parliament House, the first social organization in Central Florida was established. That was the Gay Student Association at the Florida Technological University, now the University of Central Florida. From its establishment in 1976 until the early 90s, this gay student group was quite closeted. It did very little to publicize its meetings. It met mostly in homes of its members. However, in 1994, a small group of activists and I as its faculty advisor brought GSA out of its closet, not quietly or slowly, but with a loud bang. The group changed its name to the Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Student Union. It advertised its meetings on the campus bulletin boards and in the UCF College newspaper. Members wore GLBSU t-shirts in public. That same year, two of its officers marched in the Orlando Pride Parade. GLBSU also created the first gay exhibit for the UCF library, and it lasted for an entire month. In the years that followed, GLBSU's activities became increasingly well known in Central Florida's GLBT community. Together with its volunteer efforts in Central Florida and its bringing renowned GLBT speakers to campus, such as Keith Meinhold, Greg Luganis, Mandy Carter, and Chastity Bono. Two of GLBSU's hallmark achievements have been its National Coming Out Day celebrations, first on campus and then on the steps of Orlando City Hall. And later as a co-founder of Central Florida's hugely popular Come Out With Pride Festival. GLBSU's other notable activity has been its very successful Diva Invasion shows, which annually bring drag queens to campus to perform in the elaborate and risque productions. In the late 1970s, the first GLBT service organizations emerged in Central Florida. Gay Social Services was incorporated in November of 1978. GSS eventually evolved into the present day center, which provides multiple services to GLBT persons. A gay hotline was started in March of 1979. It provided peer counseling and referrals to its callers. The very first Pride celebration in Central Florida was held in June of 1979 at Turkey Lake Park. The event called attention to the Stonewall Riots, which occurred in June 10 years earlier. Central Florida's first GLBT religious organization was established in 1979. That was the Joy Metropolitan Community Church. Organized GLBT sports took hold in Central Florida in 1985 with the start of the Orange Blossom Bowling Association. In 1986, when the AIDS epidemic was sweeping our nation, Central Florida 
opened its first AIDS service organization called the Central Florida AIDS Unified Resources, commonly referred to as CENTAR. The first center for GLBT services opened its doors in September 1987 on Mills Avenue. It subsequently moved to two other locations and is now back on Mills Avenue in its fourth and latest building. A favorite organization of GLBT persons is PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. The first local chapter in Central Florida had its initial meeting in April of 1988. Brevard County now has two PFLAG chapters. Delta Youth Alliance now called the Orlando Youth Alliance, is the first organization set up to specifically serve GLBT youth. It was founded in 1990 by Terry Deicher and Jeff Horn. Central Florida's first GLBT cultural organization, the Orlando Gay Chorus, emerged in 1990. Its first concert was held in June at the Orlando Museum of Art with 36 singers. Gay Days in Orlando is a major international celebration, now drawing 150,000 GLBT participants. It began in 1991 as a single day, always the first Saturday in June, when the GLBT community and their friends were encouraged to wear red and be seen while visiting the world's most popular theme park. The first gay day, which drew an estimated 3,000 attendees, was spearheaded by Doug Swallow and a group of friends, the GLBT Community Center, businesses, and the online users of CompuWho. Gay Days has evolved into a week-long citywide celebration. It offers round-the-clock activities including multiple theme park visits, cocktail soirees, concerts, and a host of internationally renowned parties. Orlando's first regional pride parade was held in June of 1991. An estimated 800 people watched the parade. Central Florida's most celebrated case of institutional discrimination involved Deputy Sheriff Thomas Woodard, who is fired because he is gay. He won his highly publicized civil rights case against Orange County on March 21, 1992. The Metropolitan Business Association is the first local GLBT Chamber of Commerce. The organization was first formed in 1992 and today boasts over 200 business organizations and business professionals. In June of 1992, the first GLBT bookstore in Central Florida opened for business. The owner, Bruce Ground, located his business on Mills Avenue in what later became known as Orlando's By My District. As the years passed, Central Florida's GLBT cultural choices expanded. In 1993, out loud, became the first GLBT radio show in Central Florida. GLBT theater options increased and included traditional female impersonators, Act Out Theater, Wanzee Productions, The Hatbox Review, and The Acting Studio. Although other newsletters and newspapers preceded it, Watermark became the principal gay newspaper in Central Florida, 
Watermark was first published in August of 1994. Although bowling was the first local organized sport, softball became the most popular. The Central Florida Softball League formed in 1997, now has 34 teams in the league. A big array of sports now exists for those GLBT persons who are athletically inclined. On the political front, in 2000, Orlando elected Patty Sheehan as its first openly lesbian city commissioner. And in 2002, after a very long political battle led by local GLBT activists, Orlando passed its first gay rights law, referred to as Chapter 57. The law protects gays and lesbians from discrimination in the private sector. In 2005, National Coming Out Day celebrations in Central Florida which were organized in the past by the Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Student Union, GLBSU for short, were taken over by the Metropolitan Business Association for leadership and financial support. The NCOD celebrations from then on changed from rallies to festivals and parades. Also in 2005, the GLBT History Project of Central Florida was formed, spearheaded by Debbie Simmons, who is then president of the Metropolitan Business Association, and by me, Dr. Ken Kazmierski, a retired social work professor. The History Project's first exhibit was held in the Orange County History Museum in conjunction with the first Come Out with Pride celebration. The exhibit was small, having been put together in a matter of a few months without an office, without a budget, and initially with no items to display. A committee was quickly formed to organize an exhibit celebrating the upcoming National Coming Out Day. Members of that first history committee used personal memorabilia to create collages of pictures and documents from GLBSU, MBA, and the first Pride Parades. Calls to local organizations also produced a fourth collage of pictures from the Joy Metropolitan Community Church. Subsequent exhibits were much more elaborate and professional. In 2010, the History Project changed its name to the GLBT History Museum of Central Florida, recognizing the tremendous growth in its collection, its virtual online museum, and its mobile museum, which exhibits at organizations, businesses, and events as requested. As of 2010, the Greater Orlando Metropolitan Area ranks ninth in the nation in number of GLBT residents. Moreover, the GLBT community of Central Florida enjoys greater, though not complete, local tolerance and acceptance.